Okay, um, I asked him to play Usher when I came out. That was not Usher. Uh, hey, it's, it's such an honor uh, to be here tonight. Uh, as, as Jesse said, uh, Sean and Chad, uh, they were actually my youth pastors. And uh, I've known them since I was 10 years old. And uh, when I needed God the most, they were there. When I needed a moment, uh, they were there. So um, there, there's not uh, many places uh, that I, I get emotional about, about coming to a place where uh, somebody poured into me uh, 20 years ago. And uh, if, if that doesn't teach you anything else, but you never know uh, who you're reaching out to, you never know who you're encouraging, uh, because you, you just never know who, who they might become. And uh, they took a chance on me, and I, I'm just honored to... Uh, you're, you have amazing, amazing pastors, and I want you to know that. And, um, and I'm honored... Uh, to be friends with Jesse and John, like just everything that is happening here is, is so amazing that um, I, I lead a young adults group in Dallas. And so I went to my leadership team and I said, hey, we got to go to Red Rocks Young Adults. And so uh, actually I brought 13 people with me. I rolled deep. OK. Um, and uh, about about 80 percent of them are, are single. Um, so if you came here and you scoping and hoping glory to glory and you checking out somebody on your right and your left, and uh, maybe you're looking for a long-distance relationship, I got you. Um, just tweet me and just say holla, okay? At Ryan Lake, holla. And uh, we got a doctor in the house, a chef. He owns a restaurant. Uh, she's in the CrossFit. Whatever, whatever, my, you know, whatever you got to do. I came for multiple reasons tonight, and I believe God's going to move in a powerful way in your life, more ways than, than you think. Um, I'm, I'm super excited about God's word tonight. We're actually going to be going to uh, Mark chapter 10, and uh, they're going to they're have it on the screen as well. Um, the, the Bible says this in verse 17, and as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him, speaking of Jesus, and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And, and he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. I want to speak to you tonight on the subject of uh, who's the boss. I want you to look at your neighbor on the right and say, who's the boss? <laughs> I want you to look at your other neighbor and say, go Broncos. <laughs> God, I thank you for these moments that uh, we have tonight. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would take charge. Uh, that you would do something uh, for somebody that maybe is visiting for the first time, perhaps somebody in the room uh, that needs a moment. And I pray, Lord, that they wouldn't be disappointed. I pray that they wouldn't just come to a church and, and just for show, just for kicks, just out of routine. I pray, Lord, that we would encounter you in a mighty way. In the mighty name of Jesus, everybody say it. Um, have you ever had somebody make you feel rich? I mean, you thought you was poor until you met them. <laughs> like, usually poor stories are, are like food related. They're like, man, I had to eat peanut butter and jelly for like a week. And you come back like, well, hey, at least you had the jelly. You know, it's like, <laughs> like somebody, like their situation is worse than your, like, it, like it, and it could be a car situation. Like, you think you had a bad car until you see the person who's duct taping their door shut <laughs> every time they roll up. I was a... Uh, I was speaking at a conference, and, and there was this parking lot with, like, all the guest speakers, and most of them were rental cars, so it, it really wasn't a big deal, and uh, when, when I pulled in, but it, it was nicer cars. It, well, I pulled in, and, and I see this car as soon as I pull in. Now, if you notice, uh, you can see through this man or woman's hood. I didn't think, wow, this is a horrible car. I thought, is this street legal Jesus? Are they... Are they going to be okay tonight? If it rains, do they have to check the weather every morning to figure out if they can go outside? Like, like, but, but in that moment, I saw their car and thought, I feel pretty rich. I'm not going to lie. I, feel, I, I wanted to leave $5 in the window just to say, 
change your do so, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I, 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 I have no words for, for this vehicle. Uh, I, I love um, Christians and money because it, it gets kind of funny. And, and some people in the world don't want Christians to have too much money. Like, they want you to be blessed, but not too blessed, okay? Like, they want you to have a nice house, but not in a gated community. Don't get crazy, okay? <laughs> you can drive a Chevy Traverse, but if you're riding a Range Rover, it's like, whoa, 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 buddy, what's going on? Give some of that to the poor, trade it. It just gets, it gets funny. Uh, you ever had that friend, they drive a station wagon? Ain't nothing wrong with a station wagon. It's a family car. That's cool. Um, but then they station wagon break down. And they got money to buy a new car, but they're a saver. So they're like, nah, nah, nah. But then when they have to, all of a sudden they get a BMW, but they are shy about it. So you leave Red Rocks Young Adults, and you thought they had a station wagon. You see them get in the car, you're like, all right, Johnny, I'll holl- Hey. <laughs> hey, Johnny, when you, hey, man, when you get the BMW? He get all shy. Nah, nah, man, it's, 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 it's a 2013, man. <laughs> oh, for real? Well, when did you get the 2013? Man, man, my dad helped me with the down payment, man. It ain't even really like, like, like it's a bad thing to have money church. Um, have you ever had somebody that made you feel poor? Like you thought you had some money until you met them. And all of a sudden, like you, you felt like, oh, why, does, why is it that I feel like my, my stuff just isn't good enough? And you have the 2013 BMW. And then you see somebody driving down the road with a 2015, and you looking like, man, this car is absolutely amazing. I, I remember when me and my wife uh, were, were just dating. I was living downtown Dallas, and I had a sports car at the time before we had a baby and became a family man. So I had the sports car, and I thought I was cool, right? So I was like, listen, baby girl, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to take you out tonight to a nice place, wine and dine. You be at the crib, 6.30, on the dot, on the clock. We're going to make it happen. And so I, I'm like, dress up, wear something nice, like, this is going to be great, take you to this nice steakhouse, this is going to be great. We go out there, try to start the car, ch 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 nothing. Car wouldn't start. So it was like, well, can we take your car? Well, somebody gave her this car. Now, this car was pretty jacked up. Uh, we called the car Jagger. The reason we called the car Jagger is because it shook when you went down the road, so it had moves. Like Jagger. So, so we called it Jagger. So Jagger just be like riding like this all day long, okay? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's an old car, and I'm like, listen, the place we go and does valet, <laughs> and I just don't, I just don't feel, can we just go to Chipotle? I know I told you <laughs> we were going somewhere nice, but I'm telling you, we pull up in the valet. This dude looked at us like, are you lost, sir? <laughs> sir, can we help you find McDonald's? Because... These cars aren't allowed. I'm like, listen, I got money. I will pay for everything in here, okay? But my car, I got a situation right now, okay? Like, like give me a break. But you just, you just feel poor. It's, it's like we're all asking, whoa. <laughs> Jesus, is that you? <laughs> Did Jesus just walk in here? Did y'all see that? It's like we all got this question of, of what, what is really rich. In fact, studies show that you think rich is twice the amount of what you have in your bank account right now. So if you got $20 right now, anybody with 40, you like, dang, baller, what's it like? What's it like with the 40 piece, bro? Like, if you make $20,000 a year, somebody makes 40, like, man, living the high life, man, what's happening? And they study this. Guys that make $2 million are like, no, I'm not rich. The people that make $4 million, they're, they're rich. It's like rich is, is, this, is this moving target. And so when you, when you try and define what it really is, it, it's very difficult. I was talking to one of my friends one day, and I said, man, what, what really makes a baller? Like what, what, like, what item must one attain to have true baller status? Like, he has this item, and you're like, baller. <laughs> baller. And it was like, is it a watch? Like, no, 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 because it's just a watch, you know. No, okay, okay, well, let's move on. Is it a house? I said, no, it's a guest house. Like, if he got a guest house, that's ball. I'm like, no, 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 that's just for his in-laws. Like, well, like something, what, 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 what's the actual Lamborghini? Yeah, but there's some people that get a Lamborghini and they broke. So they spent all their money on the Lamborghini, so they ain't got no money, so they can't even go nowhere in the car. They just driving around taking pictures. So... <laughs> It's like, oh, I don't know. like, we went back and forth on all these different items, items of clothing, whatever it may be. We just kept poking holes and everything. I said, ah, I got it. I got it. Segway. <laughs> if you got a Segway, you got money just to burn for no reason. You don't need, you don't need money. You're just like, you're just like I'm going to zoom around to the refrigerator. 
because I can. That's a baller. Uh, uh, if you're looking at this guy in the Bible in Mark chapter 10, the rich young ruler, he is asking a question to Jesus, looking for more than just rich. He's actually looking for eternal life. He has uh, attained something in life that we would all deem as rich, but now he's looking for something for his soul. Something's wrong. He's got everything you and I could ever want, but yet he doesn't have anything that he needs. He is in a searching mode, and he's having a conversation with Jesus. And it's amazing how the Bible tells his story. In the Christian faith in church, um, we've known this guy as the rich young ruler. But um, actually, Matthew describes him as young, and Mark describes him as rich, and only Luke describes him as a ruler. That's how we got to call him the rich young ruler. Ruler, and, and if you look at each entity of his life, I believe that tonight God wants to speak to the part of us that is young. I believe that tonight God wants to speak to us, to the part of us that is rich. And he wants to speak to the part of us that's a ruler. And what's interesting about his story is he falls to his knees. That's the first thing he did. And he, he, the Bible says that he ran to Jesus. And he falls to his knees and he says, help my soul. Help my soul. What do I got to do? Tell me what I must do to gain eternal life. What must I do to be in? Like in, in your world, like I have enough stuff to impress millions of people, but there's something missing in my life, and Jesus is like, okay, well, let's just have this conversation. Like, let's, let's just figure things out here. Um, hey, man, if, if you want to gain eternal life, keep the commandments. This man in, in Matthew, in the Matthew version of his story says, which ones? Like, well, which one? Like, break it down for me. Uh, at this point in Scripture, there were over 600 commandments that a Jew could follow to be in. So he's going, hey, could you break it down? Like, which one is the best one for me to get in, for me to have a status of eternal life? What, what, what do I got to do? J Jesus, he, he breaks it down for him. He says, hey, it's all right. You, you, want, you know the commandment. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus looking at him, loved him. Jesus didn't look at him and despise him. Jesus didn't look at him and rebuke him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And maybe you came into this room tonight with more questions than answers. And perhaps you thought with your questions that automatically puts you in a place for judgment. It automatically puts you on the offense like, well, well, well what, what, did I, what, did I, what did I do? I, I just have some questions. And, and the good news for you tonight is Jesus loves you. And he's strong enough, smart enough, most powerful enough to handle your questions. Like, that, like he, he's not intimidated by, by your questions and he loves you enough to meet you at your knees. And I would hate for you to come into a church and walk away. And walk away and, and, and never get to experience Jesus. You, you, you heard some great music. You heard somebody speak. You shook some hands. You, you got a donut. Great. <laughs> a donut's not going to change your life. Stop eating some donuts. Might change. Okay, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> uh, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing, man. Like, I'm looking at your life, you, you, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Um, Jesus is actually um, testing this young man. You see, if, if Jesus says, keep the commandments, Jesus strategically left off two of them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And have no other idols before me. 
Um, in fact, some scholars believe that um, we've traditionally believed that the Ten Commandments were five and five. Um, but what in some Jewish scholars teach is that it was tablet one and tablet two. Tablet one had all commandments that had to do with relations to other people. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill other people. That's bad. Don't envy other people. All of those commandments have to do with your relationship with others. But tablet two was all about your relationship with God. It's as if Jesus is going, hey, here's tablet one. Have you kept these? And the guy goes, yeah, I'm good with that. And Jesus is going, I know you're good with other people. But how are you doing with me? You see, it's easy to come to church and play church and be cool with other people and miss God completely. It's possible but I don't want that to be your story. And and, and the Bible continues, and it says in verse 22, disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Great possessions. Verse 23, Bible says, and Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, The eye of a needle in in a city was uh, actually an entryway uh, for the city at the gate. And there was a divot in which people could sneak in and out of the city. So it was literally impossible for a camel because of its back to even get into the city. And so Jesus is going, hey, good luck. I, I, I mean, you're screwed. I, I mean, it's over for you. Like, there, there's, like if, if you've got wealth, which you're in America, you, if you drove here, you're rich. Uh, 91% of the world does not have a car. Like, a vehicle. Not a nice vehicle, a vehicle. And, and, and about 4% of the world has, only them have two cars. So if you got here tonight, you're extremely rich. Like, you don't get to go, oh, you mean those people that live in that neighborhood? No. It's it's us. And and they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? It's like the disciples knew, like, man, we roll with Jesus. We got treasure. We, we We got a little bit of bread. We got some dough. And and in all reality, like, if if this guy who kept all the commandments. He was a good person. He was good to other people, perhaps generous churchgoer. Like, if, if, he would, if he can't be saved, then who can? Who, who, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, see, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, I truly say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Unfortunately, This story about the rich young ruler is one of the only people who had a close encounter with Jesus and walked away. I mean, he's one of the only people that that came running. I mean, he came running to the feet of Jesus and said, just tell me, tell me, tell me what I got to do. Tell me, tell me what I got to do. And Jesus says, you just got to let go of the thing that's holding on to you. You've you've, got to let go of these possessions that are really possessing you and he's the only man in the scripture who fell to his knees and just said I don't think so you see uh, there's something that happens with millennials there's something that happens uh, with with young adults that just we we just want to be in charge Uh, Luke describes him as as a ruler, as as his own boss. I get the feeling that this entrepreneur, this business owner just said, man, I kind of like being in charge. I I, kind of like running the show. I I, I don't, I I mean, I'm a good Christian, but I I just, 
I kind of got an issue when people try and tell me what to do with my life. And there's a part of us that just wants to be in charge. And Jesus, while you're on your knees, you've walked into this place and you're worshiping. You're going, I surrender all. You can have it all. Okay, Lord. Like, but he's going, can I really have it all? Like, we, we have these things that really have a hold on us. And for some of you, maybe it is money. Maybe it's the idea of money. Perhaps you came in here tonight and you believe that money can solve some of your biggest problems. You've got some student loans. You've got some debts. You've got some things you would like to attain because it would mean a certain status in your world to some people. Would you give that to Jesus? Like, would you let him be in charge? Would you not be the person that comes to church and says, God, you can't have it all, but listen, 80% is all yours. You can have most of me, God. Like, would you be the person that doesn't fall to your knees and walks away and says, oh, talk about anything but my money. Uh, uh, talk about anything but, but my authority. What, what's the thing that's got a hold of you? What's the thing that you just won't give to Jesus? Uh, is it your image? Is it something that you've just obsessed over? Is it something that somebody said to you in middle school? They said something that wrecked you. And from that day forward, you said, okay, I'm going to prove something to them. And you don't even see them anymore. Yet you're still proving. Hoping that the people you went to middle school with will check you out on Facebook and stalk you and go, yeah, they got it going on. Like, like that people will look us up and go, yeah, I, I, I made it. Like there's something in us that feels like we have to prove something to other people, that we have to prove something to our family, that we have to prove something to our leaders. Like there, there's something in us that's going, I, I, I want to I wanna be in charge. I, I mean, is the thing for you anger? Is it something like, man, I, I'm, just, I'm just mad all, all the time. And, and you know what? It's my prerogative to, to be mad, but like, would you give that anger to Jesus and just say, hey, I just, I just don't think life is lived best angry. Is it, is it an authority issue? Maybe, maybe the, 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 the source of your authority issue is the fact that dad left and somebody broke your trust. Somebody in your world broke your trust. And, and all of a sudden, you go, listen, I got an issue with every person that ever has authority over me because the last person that had authority over me left me. And so now I live in a world where I can't trust anybody. Um, it, is the thing that maybe it, that is holding on to you, that's keeping you from connecting with Jesus at another level, is it past mistakes? Like, did you have a, a child out of wedlock? Did you have a night that you wish you could forget? Do you have days in your past that you wish you could get back? And you've yet to give that to Jesus. And you spend your whole life hoping nobody ever finds out. Like, would you just hand it over? Like, would you not be a person that says, you can have 95% of me, but this one thing, that thing that happened to me, I'm, I'm going to hold on to this because... This is just who I am. This is just how, how I am. This is just how I grew up. This, do you, this is how, what my parents taught me. It, it's, it's the thing that's holding you back in old theology. Go, oh, I didn't grow up in a church like Red Rocks, and, and we were taught that. And so an old theology keeps you from diving deeper into a relationship with Jesus because somebody painted a picture for you that was inaccurate, and it was just like, well, no, we, we just we, we go to church, and, and we give to missions, and, and we, just, we just follow Seven of the Ten Commandments. And we just, we just, we're, we're nice to people. We're just kind. And for you, that, that's holding you back. A denomination that you grew up in, it, it, it's, it's a theology that perhaps has got you messed up. What's holding on to you? And you think you've got control of it, but it's really got control of you. The worship team can make their way back up. There's a, a story that, that happened in 1988. Um, 
it was between a, a father and, and a son. And a, a year prior to this day, they lost his wife, the boy's mother, in a tragic car accident. And so the dad, he says, hey, you know what, son? I'm always going to be there for you. I promise. I'm always going to be there for you. And so a year goes by, and, and he, he changes jobs. He changes the job so that he can drop his son off at school and pick him up from school. He, he's making less pay. He's making some adjustments to make it work so that he can always be there for his son. In 1988, there was a 10.0 earthquake, and it happened right after this father dropped off his son at school. And he's, he's walking away. He's about four blocks away, and, and all of a sudden he feels the ground shake, and he turns around, and he watches the school plummet to the ground. Then you can hear screaming everywhere. People are freaking out. Wires are going everywhere. And, and he runs to the front of the school. And the only thing standing there is a gate. And the whole school is in the ground. And moms are screaming. And, and, and anybody that was around that wasn't in the building is, is freaking out. And, and all of a sudden he just says, okay, I've dropped him off at school. Okay, if I just go. 13 steps forward. Okay, his classroom was over here. And he gets to the spot where he believes his son's classroom is, and he just starts digging. I mean, he's just digging for hours, and he's just moving one boulder at a time as, as best as he can, and people are telling him, hey, stop. And he goes for four hours, and his, his hands start to bleed. They're, they callous. He couldn't even feel his hands anymore, but he's just continuing to move rocks. 12 hours. 18 hours sleep deprived, 24 hours, he's just not giving up. He's seen the sun set, he's seen the sun rise, and, and, and it just doesn't matter. He's just, he's just not giving up, and the fire department's like, hey, it's, you, you got to get out the way. He's like, I, I, I have to keep looking for my son. 30 hours, 34 hours, 36 hours, he gets to a place where there is a boulder over a big hole. He takes a piece of iron and sticks it in there and busts it open. And inside this big hole, he looks down and he yells, son. And all of a sudden, the little boy goes, dad. And he said, reach for my hand, son. Reach for my hand. He said, no, my friend's first. And this dad pulled out 17 students out of a dark hole. And I don't know what you came in here with tonight. And I don't know what's got you buried alive. I don't know what's got a hold on you, that's got a weight on you. But there's a God who's sticking out his arm to you tonight to say, hey, don't leave this place unchanged. And I'll tell you what had me buried alive. You see, um, I, I grew up, um, I don't want to say crazy poor, but poor enough to not afford the OR like we was poor. Like we, we, we were like, it was paycheck to paycheck. Like it was, it was, it was rough. Um, we were the family that uh, would go to the gas station and be like, hey, let me get a dollar 67 on pump two. Like I, I remember uh, when I first got my license, I would look for change in the couch to, to go out, like, like, just to get a gallon of gas was, was a big deal. Like, if, I, I think maybe four or five times in my life did I ever see our gas tank full. Like, like that, was, that was what rich people did. Like, rich people got gas. Like, we couldn't. Like, if you got $5 worth of gas, it was like, this is a great day. And uh, I'll never forget, we, were, uh, we went to this gas station, and this is before you, you had to pay first. This is where you could pump and, and then go in and pay. And, and a guy before us, uh, he pumped $20, and my dad literally went there to put $5 in, in a car, and, and the guy came out and said, hey, uh, you owe us $25. My dad was like, no, I, I only I only pumped five. What, what are you talking about? He's like, no, you pumped 25 And I remember uh, sitting in this car waiting for my mom to bring us our last $20 for two hours. And I'm sitting in this gas, at the this parking lot of this gas station, upset at the world. And I said in that parking lot that day, I said, you know what? I will never be poor, ever. Like, when I grow up, I'm going to be rich. I, I, I don't care. I will never be in this situation again. My kids will never feel this. 
and it drove me. So I started businesses. I, I, I said, you know, I don't want to go to school for ministry. I'm going to go to school for business so I can, so I can be a businessman because that's, 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 what, that's what I thought I, I, I had to be. I, I was trying to prove something. I had made an unholy vow, like I, I'll never be poor. And I had this, this thing, and, and all of a sudden I start building a family, and, and we start getting some cars. And, and before I know it, I'm driving my wife crazy because every single day I go get gas. I wash our cars and put gas in them every single day. Like, like literally we drive 20 miles. And I'm like, hey, babe, I got to go to the gas station. She's like, for what? I was like, did we not just drive 20 miles? What's wrong with you? She's like, you got a problem. And, and I don't know what it is, but any time that my gas tank would get below three-fourths of a tank, it would send me back to a parking lot when I was in fifth grade. It would send me back to a moment where I just felt poor. I just felt not good enough. And I'm, I'm sitting at this retreat with my pastors and I'm telling them this story and my pastor lovingly looked at me just like Jesus lovingly looked at this rich young ruler and he says, this has got to stop. This thing, you, you don't have control of it. It's got control of you. You gotta let it go, Ryan. You, you, you some love you can't let your gas you can't let your gas tank get on e every now and then bro and he said this is what it'll lead to i've seen this path before and this will destroy your family this will destroy your future it's okay to make money it's okay to build business it's okay to to be successful but not the way you're doing it and then another pastor looked at me and he said can i submit something to you ryan I said, sure. He said, I don't see a poor dad. I see a dad who's faithful enough and has enough integrity to pay another man's bill. And so you've carried for 20 years that your dad was poor, but I see your dad as a man who was faithful. So would you allow the Holy Spirit to do surgery on your past and change some things and change a little bit of perspective? And in that moment, I felt like I got healing from something. I felt like in that moment, I kind of let go and just went, okay. My definition of being a great dad is not going to be summed up in how much money I can make in my life and, and if I can send him to college. That's not going to be the thing that defines me. That's the thing that had me buried alive. I don't know what the thing that is that has you buried alive. And I, I, I don't know exactly how, how you got here. I don't know if a friend invited you, but I do know this. I do know that I was just supposed to come visit and I don't think it's just an accident that I was speaking tonight because I know that perhaps God orchestrated your steps to be in the seat that you're sitting in and for me to be standing on the stage I'm standing on because he knew that somebody at Red Rocks Young Adults needs somebody to move a rock. And maybe, and maybe that's you. And, and here is the beautiful thing about the gospel. Oh, Jesus' greatest move in history was moving a rock. Um, if you've never heard the story, uh, Jesus died on a cross for each and every person's sin that has ever lived. And they buried him in a tomb. And all of humanity changed when he moved a rock. And he rose again from the grave with the keys of death in his hands and says, this isn't going to control people anymore. So would you want to receive that tonight? We're just going to go in, into some worship. And maybe for you, uh, you don't want to stand in your normal spot. Maybe for you, you want to move. Maybe for you, you want to come to the front. Maybe you want to be like the rich young ruler and you want to kneel, except you want to be changed. You don't want to walk away unchanged. But regardless of, of what you do in the next few moments, here's what I do want every single person to do in a life group this week, I want you to ask yourself three questions. Number one, who's the boss? Like, who is in charge of your life? Who runs things? Who makes decisions uh, about your money? Who makes decisions about your career? Who makes decisions about the relationships you will have and will not have? Who makes decisions? Who's the boss? Number two, what's the thing that you're holding on to? What's the thing that in your life that you feel like 
and you feel like you have to hold on to it, like it's a part of you. And the third question I want you to talk about in the life group, and perhaps you're, you, you're not in one yet, but you, could, you have the opportunity to join one tonight, but, but maybe just with some friends, you, you have this discussion to say, um, the last question is, what would it look like for you to let it go? What would it look like for you to just to... Working out's not bad, but this thing isn't gonna own me. Well, like, what, what, what does it look like to say, you know, man, I, there's nothing wrong wearing nice clothes, but at the same time, it, it, this, this, isn't gonna, this isn't gonna make or break me. This isn't going to be the thing that defines my life. Who's the boss? What's that thing in your life? It's gotta hold on you. And what does it look like to let it go? God, I thank you for my friends at Ray Rocks, Young Adults. And I know it is not an accident that we are in the same room together. And I pray that you would move a rock for some people. I pray that you would move some barriers that are in between you and them tonight. I pray that we wouldn't come in a room and encounter you and walk away unchanged. And so tonight, we surrender all, not part, all to you. In Jesus' name I pray, everybody says.